Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Gayatri Gopinath. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at New York University. Thank you so much for being here. There's um, hundreds of you joining us, and I'm so thrilled about this. Welcome to the panel, Radical Kinship, Solidarity, and Political Belonging. Um, so I want to begin by thanking our co-sponsors, the Asian Pacific American Institute and the Latinx Project at NYU. I also want to thank, as always, our associate director, Robert Campbell, um, as well as our student assistants, Sonia Maruka and Eleni Retta, as well as our live captioner today, Joshua Edwards. So by way of background, um, this panel is the brainchild of Layal Fatuni, who was the global visiting scholar at CSJS in spring 2020. So this is actually a conversation that we meant to have a full year ago when Layal was with us in New York City. Um, of course, the pandemic uh, cut short her visit. And um, then we were hoping to reschedule the panel in the fall. Um, only to have the Beirut explosion, the Beirut port explosion happen. So now we're finally gathered um, in the aftermath of the George Floyd decision, as well as the multiple um, killings that we've had since then. Um, so in a way, the, the pandemic, the crisis in Lebanon, um, the George Floyd murder and its aftermath, all of these events have in some ways really marked this panel from its inception. And, you know, to my mind, all of these ongoing crises reinforce so clearly the need for precisely this conversation on radical kinship, solidarity, and political belonging. So I'm very grateful for Layal, um, to Layal for um, having initiated this conversation. And I really can't think of a better group of people to engage in this discussion than the folks um, we have here today. So I'm very briefly going to introduce them. You can find their full bios in the chat. Um, Lyle Fatuni will be moderating today's discussion. Lyle is an assistant professor of gender studies and critical theory at the graduate gender program at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Her current research project is entitled Ecologies of Violence, Affirmations of Life at the Frontiers of Survival, which explores the politics of life and death in Syria and Palestine. Lisa Dugan is a journalist, activist, and professor of social and cultural analysis at NYU. She's the author of many books, most recently Mean Girl, Anne Rand, and Neoliberal Greed, which is in the book series American Studies Now, which she co-edits at University of California Press. Che Gossett is a black non-binary femme writer. They are a fellow in critical studies in the Whitney Independent Study Program and a recently minted PhD from the Women's and Gender Studies um, uh, Department at Rutgers University. Congratulations, Che. Um, next, we'll have Shalyn Rodriguez, who is an artist, educator, writer, and community organizer based in the Bronx. Shalyn holds a BFA in visual and critical studies from the School of Visual Arts and an MFA in Fine Art from CUNY Hunter College. Her work has been exhibited throughout the city, including at El Museo del Barrio, Queens Museum, and the New Museum. And finally, we'll have Helga Tawil Suri, who is an associate professor in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication, as well as in the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at NYU. Helga works on technology, media, culture, territory, and politics with a particular focus on the Middle East, especially Palestine, Israel. So the panel, um, so just so you know how, how this is gonna go, the panel will last 75 minutes. We'll begin with opening statements from each of the panelists for around eight minutes or so. Um, Lyle will then moderate a discussion between the panelists for 15 minutes, and then we'll open, up, open it up to questions from all of you for the last 15 minutes. And you know, we very much welcome your participation. So if you have a question for the panelists, please post it at any time in the Q&A function, not in the chat function. Um, I'll be checking your questions and I'll post them to the panelists at the end. So with that, I'll turn it over to Lyon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gayatri, for the invitation, Robert, for organizing this event, and the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at NYU for hosting it. Of course, thanks to all the wonderful speakers who have accepted to take part in this. 
The panel was born out of a sense of urgency, an urgency to both think, act, and move in solidarity as scholars, activists, artists in our global current political conjuncture. Despite their differential configurations across the globe, the increasing normalization of right-wing ideologies, severe wealth inequalities, state violence, racism, heteropatriarchy, settler colonialism and ecological devastation attest to the urgency to address questions of solidarity, kinship and ethico-political belonging at a planetary level today. It goes without saying the global pandemic of COVID-19 has exposed and further exacerbated racial and social inequalities within and across communities and societies. Not only did COVID-19 and the global pandemic show how the world is interdependent, it further exposed what we already knew, that vulnerabilities, risks, and the mattering of lives are differentiated along the axis of geopolitical divides, race, class, ability, and gender. Addressing solidarity, which is the uh, theme of the panel, inevitably raises questions such as, what constitutes the basis of shared struggles upon which solidarity politics emerge? Of course, solidarity is not something that is given. As my dear friend and comrade Miriam Aurag argues, it is not something that pre-exists, but it's something, but it's, but it's, it's, sorry, but it's a coming together to break the existing state of things, a coming together that is founded on radical kinship. To change everything, to use Ruth Wilson Gilmore's words, and to sustain the struggle to do so demands that we establish modes of relationality and interdependencies committed to justice and freedom from violence and want. A common yet more narrow understanding of kinship pertains to notions of lineage, genealogical ties, marriage and the family, more specifically in the capitalist logic of property and ownership. And there's been a lot of work that has been done in black feminist, indigenous and queer scholarship that contests such limited notions of kinship that I sadly will not have the time to get into in this short introduction. The panel approaches kinship in a more expansive way. Kinship as the responsibility of making kin in a world that breaks us apart from each other through state violence and racial and patriarchal capitalism. Focusing more specifically on the question of solidarity and political belonging, I want to invite us to think how radical kinship can establish modes of relationality that foreground collective care and collective struggle against forms of violence and dispossession that subjects our bodies, communities, and environments to debilitation and death. I bring kinship up today in relation to solidarity because I see a return to a certain form of identity politics and activist circles and political organizing in the US and Europe that has been recently described by Barbara Smith from the Combahee River Collective as, and I quote, an identity politics that foregrounds identity but leaves the politics behind. In this regard, it is telling to observe a growing traction of a strand of pessimistic political intellectualism emerging hand in hand with a more experience-based approach to intersectionality and, active, and activist discourse. The former, exemplified in Frank Wilderson's work on Afro-pessimism, homogenizes the Black experience and Black suffering as non-analogous with what Wilderson calls, and I quote, junior partners of white people, all of whom need anti-Blackness in order to live, close quote. Under junior partners, he includes all non-Black people of color, such as Palestinian, Indigenous people, women, queer, and trans people of color, trans people who are not Black. In addition, an experience-based approach to intersectionality collapses complex constellations of social relations and structures of oppression to competing experiences of oppression and injury that impede on the possibility of solidarity. And so a radical kinship based on solidarity does not lay claims to the commonality of experience or lack thereof as the grounds from which we either come together or fall apart. Of course, the question is not to get rid of experience, but, to, but what to do with it and how to reconcile it with a broader political consciousness that in line with Ruth Wilson Gilmer's abolitionist thought sees our struggles to tear down the systems of violence across geographies as also struggles to make life, to insist on life. 
Finally, Making Kin is also about connecting with the legacy of international struggles that preceded us, rather than reinventing the wheel. From the long history of Black Palestinian solidarity, internationalism and the Black radical tradition, transnational feminist and queer struggles, anti-colonial and anti-capitalist struggles, and so on. It is within these frameworks that the panel has been conceived, inviting contributors to think and address our multiple, messy, and often conflicting political affinities that can activate new, new socio-political imaginaries and envision alternative foundations and horizons for coalitional politics. Before giving the floor to the next speaker, I would like to close this introduction by reading a section of a poem by Jamaican American poet, activist and essayist June Jordan entitled Moving Towards Home. I was born a black woman and now I am become a Palestinian. Against the relentless laughter of evil, there is less and less living room. And where are my loved ones? It is time to make our way home. Without further ado, I now give the floor, or shall I say the screen, to our first speaker, Lisa Duggan. Hi, hello everyone. I mean, I would ask my co-panelists to turn their cameras on if you don't mind doing that, um, just because it, it gives less of a sense of talking to nothing and no one and see actual faces. Um, I'm going to speak uh, relatively briefly in, in kind of a didactic vein about a distinction that is um, a, a conceptual distinction that I think for me um, is useful and um, it may be useful for others in thinking about uh, radical kinship. And that's the distinction between the term queer kinship and the term uh, radical kinship, queer kinship, which may or may not be radical, and radical kinship, which may or may not be queer. Um, so um, first to talk a bit about queer kinship. Um, queer kinship usually describes ways of relating outside of the official channels of law, religion, and custom, outside of blood and marriage, or as anthropologists put it, consanguinity and affinity. Um, at least in the global north, speaking about the global north, official kinship structures, structures relationships, hierarchically and generationally um, in relation to the state, to property and to finance or debt through legitimated forms of economic dependency and inheritance. Um, you know, kinship has many different meanings and formations around the world, which is and what I'm saying doesn't apply everywhere. So it, it's really this particular point has to do with kinship as it's structured in the global north. Um, queer kinship has developed as an alternative form of relatedness outside of these official legitimating um, structures of recognition. Um, but queer kinship nonetheless might actually support those structures, even as it exists outside of them, um, through informal hierarchies and forms of exclusion, or through negotiated relationships with the state or with institutions of finance and property. So I just wanna give some examples of this, uh, a few of them before uh, marriage, uh, so-called same-sex marriage uh, became law and, and then to say something about after then. So in the period before marriage, an example of being the, uh, the human rights campaign um, publicly supported the privatization of social security. As long as um, uh, same-sex partnerships, um, whether they were couple relationships or not, would be recognized within those privatized structures. Um, so that's a way to try to maintain a kind of queer relation, but within the structures of, of hierarchy, um, the state and property. Um, also many uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and HIV AIDS service organizations for a long time supported domestic partnership recognition through insurance companies while they did not call for universal health care. So it was an attempt to accommodate um, queer forms of relation, queer, queer forms of kinship through the structures of private health care. Um, and the, when the marriage decision came down through the Massachusetts uh, courts, 
um, it explicitly, it, it says actually in the decision, it's not implied, it is stated in the decision that uh, marriage was going to be instituted for the purpose of supporting dependence, keeping people off the dole, and facilitating legitimate inheritance. Um, so that was the specifically neoliberal moment when household relations are being looked to as a modes of a mode of, of, of catching uh, uh, the need as social services were cut. And so gay marriage, marriage gets expanded to gay people at this moment of trying to expand privatization of social services. Um, but, you know, during the marriage debate, there was a wide and deep split between those who advocated legitimating uh, LGBT relationships and those who advocated for a more expansive form of queer kinship beyond the reproductive couple form. Um, but even those expansive forms, the not, not those that were not based on the reproductive couple, might be aligned with unequal property relations, with racial hierarchy, with exploitative commercial and financial organizations. It's queer kinship while providing a crucial form of support outside the official, outside official kinship. Um, uh, was the nonetheless um, it's no no guarantee of of radical or challenging politics and I'll give just a, a, an example a personal example um, when I was being treated for cancer I had a really wide network of people who took care of me um, and about twenty of them really put in serious time and effort um, uh, towards my care on an everyday basis. Not one of those people was biologically related to me. Um, and the only reason I really survived as well as I did was because I had a queer kinship network that had learned from the HIV AIDS epidemic that our well being absolutely depends on these queer networks outside of official kinship that support people in sustainable, material, ongoing ways. Um, so the reality of that was actually crucial um, to my personal survival. Um, but that kind of queer kinship network does not necessarily transmute into a kind of force of critique of the healthcare system, right? Of private healthcare or a force of, it doesn't necessarily become or, or, or organize itself in relation to a critical politics, even though it provides a crucial, a crucial alternative um, outside of official structures of support. So that's where I would say, uh, I would define radical kinship sort of differently, both queer and non-queer, as a network of relations that sustain life by creating alternative social institutions and distributing resources outside the official forms of owning or earning or the official uh, forms of financial discipline like debt or the official forms of state discipline like policing and incarceration. Um, and that, um, you know, biochem, conventional families are often mobilized as radical kinship networks in this sense, like religious communities are. Um, uh, biochem, conventional families among immigrants, poor and racialized populations, highly policed groups, these can be one absolutely crucial basis for radical kinship. But they may or may not also reproduce the standard exclusions of queer people. Um, so radical kinship performs to provide sustainable daily life support in relation to social and political goals. Um, and I, just to give a few brief examples of that, this all the mutual aid societies that formed during the coronavirus pandemic. It's like, I don't know if any of you have read, I can't recommend uh, strongly enough, Soph Sophie Lewis's book, Full Surrogacy Now. Um, Kami queer Sophie Lewis, uh, is trying to define reproductive relations beyond the property-based family, but it's a kind of reproductive futurism that does not, um, uh, that is not anti-maternal in the way that so much queer theory is, thinking of you, Lee Edelman, but um, many, much, much queer theory that's very anti-maternal in its conceptions of queer kinship and queer life. And Sophie Lewis is doing like this amazing work of reclaiming maternity, reproduction, and forms of reproductive futurity for a kind of 
queer notion of outside of property notions of kinship. So it's really, I think for, for queer theory in particular, this move is so important and I would uh, really recommend that. Also all the work on prison abolition, um, the work that is sustaining relations around those incarcerated in an ongoing material connected uh, way. Um, because you know, radical kinship is often based in networks that are defined by race and class, by gender and sexual descent, or by other affinities and histories. Because it's hard to sustain networks. It's hard to make them really sustaining networks without reference to these forms of rootedness. So as Lael was saying at the beginning, radical kinship in its utopian moment is not an attempt to trend to go beyond or step away from these affinities, right? And these uh, forms of racial solidarity and class solidarity and, and gender and sexual descent uh, solidarity. It's an attempt to incorporate and move with those solidarities and to make con connections through them. Um, um, and in order to produce a kind of sustainable rootedness. Um, so what makes these networks radical kinship is their work that against uh, capitalist financial and property relations, against state discipline, and against um, really quite crucially, the privatization of dependency, struggle, and joy, right? The privatization in the, in the quote unquote, the family to move away from the, the uh, state and financial discipline from the privatization of the family in favor of a sustainable collective life. Um, that builds on the kinds of networks and affinities we, we currently live with and depend on and doesn't imagine we can just step away from them. The end. Next. You muted, Lael. Uh, now I thought, yeah. Okay, now you're unmuted, okay. Uh, we'll give the floor or the screen to Che. Hey, thank you so much uh, to Gatri, to Lael, uh, and to all of my amazing co-panelists um, in kind of radical intellectual kinship and political kinship. And so it's it's really wonderful to be here in this moment um, with all of you. Um, so I thought what I'd do is talk a bit about my own <clears throat> academic uh, work and uh, which relates to my dissertation. So I'll share a screen and kind of talk with you about it. And I'll just put my time on to make sure that I'm not talking too much. Um, okay. <clears throat> so uh, my current work, which is based on my dissertation is titled Abolitionist Entanglement. Um, after the kind of Will Smith red table moment. I don't know if everybody saw this. I almost changed the, the title. Um, it's kind of entanglement as scandalized um, and actually radical kinship because, you know, there were some poly amorphous relations going on. Um, so, uh, but to take it in a, in a more um, serious bent, uh, I think about abolition as not only the struggle that has been waged uh, uh, through, you know, and, and shaped by the contours of which have been shaped by figures like Harriet Jacobs and Frederick Douglass and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, uh, Mariam Kaba, the kind of political and theoretical coordinates of abolition uh, as we know it as, as a ongoing and perennial praxis. Um, I think of it as not only challenging the brick and mortar, the steel, uh, and and the the kind of material sites of incarceration, but also the uh, carceral met metaphysics of the subject as a operative notion itself. And so I think of abolition as a continuum um, that would challenge our ways of kinship that are carceral in terms of uh, all the forms of state securitization and policing, but also the idea of the sovereignty in the self, uh, the self as property, which is the flip side of the self as commodity. And so I think that black thought, especially around the kind of 
grammar and language and conceptual almost um, armature of concepts like flesh, for example, um, from Hortense Spiller's work to Fred Moten's work that thinks of it as uh, shared and uh, provides a different way of relating and provides a, a black radicalizing of kinship, as well as, for instance, the work of Denise De Silva, who talks about difference without separability. And so I think there's a lot of phenomenal work by in black studies, black feminism, and black critical theory, black queer theory and trans theory. And so that's the kind of ground for, upon which I stand, I would say, uh, and the condition of possibility for me to do work in the world. Um, and that includes kind of critical labors as well. And so the subtitle is Ending Grammars of Capture, which is a phrase from Hortense Spillers, and which I thought was really beautiful, haunting and powerful. Um, and she's in her anthologies, she's talking about um, how to find the African uh, body in this kind of in, in historical discourse. And one uh, doesn't go back to the body because that's unavailable, but instead one goes to the grammars of capture that render this body um, up for uh, ontological, and you know, ont ontological grabs, violence, captivity, touch, um, and so that's that's the. I think of the grammars of capture as ontological, as aesthetic, and as political. And a lot of my work um, examines those different scenes of grammars of capture. So, I'll in this kind of brief presentation, I'll go through different scenes of these kind of knots of capture and how the artists involved help us to break these, break these grammars open really. And entanglement, just to mention also, you know, this is uh, rooted in Sadia Hartman's work around the entanglement of slavery and freedom. And abolition being not only the abolition of formal slavery, but also of the idea of that the certain kind of racial liberal freedom itself. And so uh, both must be undermined. So the first section uh, looks at the looks at um, black trans artists, um, in particular, my sibling Tourmaline and her amazing cinematic work and uh, the work of Keon Williams as well. And there's a phenomenal quote by Sadia Hartman that the afterlife of slavery is not only a social and political, but also an aesthetic problem. And so I'm been that led me to think about, you know, how have black trans artists taken up the afterlife of slavery as an aesthetic problem. And Tourmaline's most recent work, Salacia, about Mary Jones, uh, black trans, sorry for the sirens, black trans sex worker who was uh, from Louis, from the South, was imprisoned in 1836. Actually, Tavia Nyong'o, speaking of radical kinship and, and theoretical critical lineages, um, He's, his text, Amalgamation Waltz, is how I first learned of Mary Jones. And there was a court case. And so um, I'm really into archives. So I like ordered the transcript and became really interested in this figure. And so Jones was uh, demonized in the media, um, brought to court, interrogated for her gender, um, for her race. And so there's the, this violence of the official archive where if we turn to find Jones, we find the criminal and the police records and so little about her. And so Tourmaline is engaged in this process that might be um, very similar to, to an act of what Sidia Hartman calls critical fabulation, which is not, you know, so in the film she uses uh, magic. She thinks about how um, reimagines the life of Mary Jones. And so Mary Jones has this power to transport herself to the future as a form of escape, ology and fugitivity. And yet she transports herself to the present to kind of get away and escape. But the present is our now of all the kind of violences that Gatry, you mentioned at the beginning and Lael that you both mentioned. And so 
it leaves us with the question of, you know, what, what will it take to uh, the question of abolition, the question of the end of the world, the question of what kind of kinships and forms of politics uh, must be possible, must be produced in order to refuse and abolish this version of world uh, that is a continued scene of captivity. Um, so that is Salacia, and here are some images from it. Um, I'm nervous just about time, so maybe I'll just talk about Keon Williams and then I'll just wrap up so that I can um, listen to all the other amazing panelists and I can talk more after if anybody is interested. Um, <laughs> the, the second piece is by Keon Williams and Williams was last year a visiting artist at uh, VCU and is an installation artist. And I first came across Williams' work just living in New York in, you know, in a sense of um, Black, queer, and trans, uh, to use Laura Harris's term, aesthetic sociality as a form of, of kinship. So we met like at a party or, you know, and, um, and I went to see uh, their work. Um, and so I've seen various installations and performances. And in this, uh, image that you see here. This one was called Meditations on the Making of America. And it was at the shed in 2019. And the kind of um, crypt almost at the base there is called the womb or the vessel of the abyss. And so that grammar womb is, is Hartman, Venus and 2X, abyss and um, uh, vessel are in reference obviously to the Middle Passage and also to Glissant and Poetics of Relation where he's thinking about the abyss, that opening chapter called the boat. And so the soil that's in this abyss or vessel uh, is actually transported from St. Croix. And so there's a kind of uh, Black Caribbean, queer and trans diasporic, theoretical and political intimacy that's happening here. And so in this, scene or this performance, dirt from this abyss is thrown against the blank white canvas until it literally becomes America. And so the kind of ontological political sovereignty of America is uh, deconstructed and undone, unmade. And so I'll, I'll kind of pause there um, and in the Q&A or discussion, I can, I can talk more and uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Che. Um, and earlier, I forgot to say thank you very much, Lisa. <laughs> um, next, uh, we have Shaleen. Um, the screen is all yours. Uh, how y'all doing? Um, so I, I just prepared some slides here and um, some thinking that I've been doing since y'all threw this radical kinship at me last year. So I've been doing some reading and writing, and I'm going to share a little bit of that with y'all, okay? Let me just throw this. All right, well, we'll just do it like that. Can y'all see my screen? Y'all see my slides? Yes. All right. Awesome. So I'm going to reintroduce myself. Um, I'm Shaleen Rodriguez. Um, uh, I'm an artist, not really sure what it means to describe myself that way these days, but I make things. Um, as far as credentials, I like to describe myself as a bitch with a GED who collaged together some art degrees in my mid thirties. Um, outside of the university structure, uh, I'm a person seriously dedicated to militant study, thinking and praxis. As far as praxis is concerned, I was a member of the radical grassroots collective Take Back the Bronx for 10 years. Um, the Bronx is a place where I'm from. It's uh, a borough on the periphery of Wall Street, which is the empire. Uh, I am the second generation of displaced Puerto Ricans who came here to work in the factories in 1957. I am the descendant or remnants of the now expendable labor force I call deindustrial migrants. It is from this vantage point that I'll be speaking where I'm always speaking from actually. So um, the deindustrial migrants of New York City, um, 
are the African-American refugees and their descendants who escaped uh, Jim Crow looking for economic opportunities and relative safety in the bustling industrial economy of the North. By 1970, there were about uh, 1.6 million Black Southerners in New York City. The latter half of this migration period brought a massive influx of Puerto Ricans as a result of Operation Bootstrap, an initiative by the US government, which transformed and devastated Puerto Rico's economy. The Boricua population climaxes as about 470,000 between 1950 and 1960. Together, Black Southerners and Puerto Ricans, as well as many others from the Antilles uh, who migrated here at the time, were funneled into manufacturing jobs as New York City was uh, organized as an industrial economy. But by 1965, deindustrialization and a rapidly declining manufacturing industry invoked massive unemployment. New York City lost 600,000 jobs, averaging 100,000 jobs annually every year between 1970 and 1975. On the heels of the infamous bankruptcy of New York City, which ushered in egregious austerity measures that stripped the power of the unions and used their pensions to bail out the city, ushering in the neoliberal era, came a massive joint effort by the ruling class of New York City in the form of a branding campaign, which would serve to reinvent New York as the cultural capital of the world. The elites alongside the state manufactured a repopulation program to replace the expendable deindustrial migrants, the underclass of New York City, with a new archetype who I call neoliberal migrants. These are the knowledge workers and the creative class, the young, hip, affluent crowd of professionalized artists, middle managers, and college students corralled to a city rebranding itself by projecting an image of financial prosperity and cultural vanguardism over and above the austerity written decaying city and its expendable surplus of black and brown industrial migrants seeping in from the margins. The spatial removal process that the ruling elites of New York City began through deindustrialization, followed by planned shrinkage, the blighted areas plans, landlord arson and austerity would be amplified and become more violent in the decades to follow. I'm recognizing in this process the settler colonial logic of elimination, giving credence to the argument that settler colonialism is a structure, not an event. When settler colonialism is recognized as a structure and not an event, as argued by Patrick Wolf, its history does not stop. The logic that initially informed the frontier killing of indigenous peoples, quote, transmutes into different modalities, discourses, and institutional formations, end quote. In this case, the removal of deindustrial migrants through a concerted effort, uh, which includes the ruling elites, corporate entities, and the city. The structural understandings of the settler colonial logic of elimination, which contends that, quote, where there is no space left for removal, mass killing or assimilation become the only eliminatory options available, end quote, can be found in the ramped up violence against the inhabitants on the periphery of the empire via the repopulation program of which gentrification is a part of, in lockstep with deindustrialization, the wholesale importation of a narcotics economy invoking the crack epidemic, which would be accompanied by the AIDS crisis, the war on drugs, Rockefeller drug laws, and mass incarceration. <clears throat> Today, the industrial migrants and their descendants, along with the ongoing influx of labor migrants who make up the underclass of New York City on the periphery of the empire, continue to be locked in attention with the neoliberal migrants who have transformed the city and who are our supervisors, teachers, and executive directors who are given preference for housing and who permanently alter the, the neighborhoods they enter as the built environment is transformed in their image granting them cultural domination and deepening the sense of marginalization and exclusion. This presents roadblocks to solidarity as housing precarity coupled with the ramped up criminalization of the poor continues to escalate, solidarity between these two classes feels farther and farther away. The industrial and labor migrants who constitute the underclass are a perpetual nuisance for the city Unless, of course, they are delivering your Grubhub, your Fresh Direct, or Amazon packages, or driving your Uber. 
In the realm of politics, these complications are only exacerbated by the thick, seemingly impenetrable layer of well-funded nonprofits that determine the political landscape of the city. Neoliberal migrants make up a vast majority of this industry. Data from 2019 show that the nonprofit sector has held the third highest position among US industries for well over a decade. Numbers from a January uh, 2020 report show a concentration of 35,000 nonprofit organizations in New York City alone, with more than 600,000 employees and a payroll of $33.6 billion. More than this, the deindustrial and labor migrants on the periphery of the empire become fodder for grant proposals and funding dished out by foundations like Ford, Mellon, Open Society, and Rockefeller, among many others. These funds exert influence over nonprofits, which dictate their political agendas, as well as the instrumentalization of social practice and socially engaged art projects, which aestheticize and objectify these communities. These communities. Where deindustrial and labor migrants make their homes become a petri dish for students of all disciplines to conduct their field work and research, very much how, uh, like how the Peace Corps sent volunteers into Black communities and reservations in the 1960s to prepare them for overseas work in international development so that they gain real life experience in the internal global South on the periphery of the empire. While the structural channels which have set these violent dynamics in place between these classes persist and continue to accelerate, I don't believe that they are set in stone. There is a desire to practice radical solidarity politics among the neoliberal migrants, which take up a range of ideologically uh, leftist positions. However, roadblocks to solidarity present themselves when these neoliberal migrants fail to account for the power dynamics at play when engaging in their activism and or organizing in the public sphere, whether as members of national leftist organizations or the DSA or groupings of self-identified radicals, any attempts to impose direct, determine, undermine, or derail the efforts of radical local grassroots who are more than capable of organizing inside their communities and dealing with their own contradictions is nothing more than an abuse of the powers bestowed to them by the settler colonial and neoliberal structures that continue to eradicate the underclass of this city who continue to be the recipients of housing discrimination, displacement, police violence, and murder of which neoliberal migrants directly benefit from. In the Bronx, we see the consequences of this in our shelter systems, which are bursting at the seams which, with displaced people from Brooklyn. Neoliberal migrants must resist the urge to know better and speak for the underclass of this city, regardless of how sharp or radical they, are, they perceive their own political ideology to be. I'm almost done, y'all. The visibility granted to New York City because of its role as imperialist capital of the world makes it a launching pad and a world stage for tech, finance, art, social justice initiatives and policy work. But it also makes it a critically urgent site for international solidarity. And in the humblest of ways, it is where we from the periphery of the empire uh, clamor, demand and go into uprisings in defense of our rights, of, of, of our lives, I should say, uh, first and foremost, but um, also our right to continue to live in this city. New York City then becomes a contested space complica complicated by some of the tensions I'm trying to lay out in like my allotted 10 minutes, which are probably over by now. Um, uh, in terms of solidarity then, um, it's something that must be renegotiated between the underclass in the city and the neoliberal migrants, given the way these structures play out. This entails deep inquiry into the complexities on the ground and a commitment to strategies that are not driven by upward mobility, but by a dedication to militant struggle and liberation. We don't want any aspiring executive directors of nonprofits in our midst. Further, if we, the deindustrial migrants and labor migrants are an internal global South or the internal colonies as Malcolm X called it, then we must not only contend with the settler colonial structures that threaten our existence here in the periphery of the empire, which places us in that tension with those neoliberal migrants, but we must also be actively seeking to engage with poor working class people rising up all across the global south that mirror our conditions. What neoliberalism accomplishes locally 
in the facilitation of an optimal business climate through its bureaucratic administration of government is globally enacted in the way it facilitates an optimal development environment orchestrated by multinational corporations, NGOs, the World Bank and the IMF. So think globally, act locally still actually means something. I see an opportunity to develop this kind of international solidarity in the Bronx where the deindustrial migrant is quickly becoming a minority. The Bronx today is made up of migrants who are Garifuna, Bangladeshi, Yemeni, Cambodians and Vietnamese who have actually been here since the 70s, Albanians who have actually been here since the 90s, Ghanaians, Senegalese, Guatemalans, Haitians, and Mexicans, particularly from the Estado de Puebla, among many, many other places. With such an array of migrants from all over the global south, perhaps the greatest remittance we can send back home is our solidarity. Radical kinship or solidarity in this case that requires a constant reweaving of the social fabric in the Bronx that seeks to undermine the postures of American model minority this, which many of our folks fall prey to. This is accomplished via a politic of what Maria Alexandra Garcia calls in her forthcoming scholarship, El Inmigrante Malagradecido, or the Ungrateful Migrant. Here are the, po the possibilities for solidarity that require those of us on the periphery of the empire to undo the knots of anti-Blackness, homophobia, transphobia, and, tr and patriarchy that make the weaving of our social fabric together so difficult. It's the site where we will have to battle it out with our family members and neighbors who still believe in police and who continue to join the NYPD or corrections in alarming numbers because it's a respectable job with, be with benefits, even as they themselves are profiled in their own families incarcerated. The same applies to labor rank and file who support luxury development in the hood for the work that will ultimately displace them and the real estate brokers amongst us who rent out their evicted neighbors' apartments to fresh-faced fa fresh NYU students looking for the next up and coming neighborhood next to the subway. The renegotiations of solidarity with neoliberal migrants will look different. There are a series of questions they must ask themselves that require honest contemplations around their own desires for upward mobility. That is if they intend to hold space here inside the empire with us. What I hope to do with my observations, which is like ongoing, uh, is to you know really locate the difference between what is the local and what is citywide, what is periphery and what is the center. Perhaps we can then sense something about the power relations that present a challenge to solidarity inside the empire. And it's a conversation that's long overdue. The end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shalene. Thank you so much. Next, we have Helgata Wilsuri. Hi, thanks. I'm just gonna start my timer, if you don't mind. Um, so thank you, Layal, Gayatri, um, Robert, everybody on the panel and everybody who's invisibly uh, a participant here. Um, I, I'd like to take the case of Palestine and I'm gonna sort of go in a completely different, well, I mean, I think there's overlaps certainly with, with Shaleen, but um, somewhat also kind of a different uh, trajectory. But I'd like to take the case of Palestine to expand on what counts within our set or concerns in solidarity work as we consider the systems and structures of everyday life, both these systems of possibility, but also these systems of oppression. And so um, my objects are kind of, or my objectives are sort of twofold. One is I really wanna to bring to the fore the importance if also the contradiction of having to take into account infrastructural concerns when we're talking about um, things like solidarity um, and particularly communications infrastructures. Uh, and then um, second, and, and in that, I'm gonna sort of focus on something, um, a recent example in the US. But two, I also wanna question whether infrastructural concerns can sometimes help overcome these sort of more fundamental differences and inequalities uh, that are faced in solidarity or kind of uh, political work, both in the US and Palestine. And I think um, I'm gonna be making maybe sort of a few conceptual leaps and it's really sort of because of time, I'm kind of not really kind of getting into the details, but this idea that Shalene just sort of actually just said, right? Like we have to sort of consider um, where our conditions are mirrored, right? Sometimes I think though there is a sort of danger and this is where I'm kind of coming from that in focusing on this mirroring, sometimes there's a danger in kind of deterritorializing what is actually happening in a specific uh, 
in a specific location. So I, part of my question is how do we sort of account for these? So ultimately I'd like to propose or maybe question if we can widen the scope of what is included in our realm of concern and activism and whether we can include what we might call more infrastructural concerns that we look at the conditions and movements that are undergirding solidarity work, that the intersecting constellation of power relationships that produce unequal materiality, material realities and distinctive sociopolitical economic experiences for the individuals and the groups positioned within them also include infrastructures of housing, of labor, of mobility, of surveillance, of communications, of media representations, and so on. So to move to kind of a, a, the, the context of talking about Palestine in the US today, there is no doubt that the discussions about Palestine and Palestinian viewpoints that occur now were virtually impossible a few decades ago. So campus groups like Students for Justice in Palestine, SJP, which was formed in 93, and the BDS movement, which started in 2005, demonstrate uh, how advocacy for Palestinian rights has become part of this kind of progressive political landscape. At the same time, I think it's important to reiterate that Israel's partisans have also kind of uh, harnessed uh, elaborate mechanisms for limiting and sometimes preventing such discussions. So funds which encourage students to photograph other pro-Palestinian student activities, organizations such as Campus Watch, or Canary Mission, which document people and groups that quote, promote hatred of the USA, Israel and Jews as this kind of collective. Uh, websites which report on BDS activities and describe them as a political warfare campaign. Um, efforts to describe uh, SJP students as quote, a well-financed festering hate group, end quote, and wide ranging uh, efforts to equate anti-Zionism or any critique of Israel with anti-Semitism and then attempting to legally redefine this as a form of hate speech. So as an example, our very own Middle Eastern Studies Department here at NYU was unrighteously and problematically, although perhaps comedically, uh, referred to as Gaza on Washington Square, right? So like the danger is right here. But perhaps the most prominent, I think, example is that actually of the censoring of the Leila Khaled Zoom events in fall 2020. And I think she's supposed to speak again tomorrow. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, but as some of you may remember, in late October, Zoom unilaterally canceled an NYU webinar, We Will Not Be Silenced, against the censorship and criminalization of academic political speech, which intended to discuss the previously censored or embargoed Zoom-based events at San Francisco State University and the University of Hawaii. Zoom at the time announced that the participation of Leila Khaled on its platform violated its terms of use and community standards and stated that this cancellation was due to Ms. Khaled's quote, recently reported glorification of violence, end quote, during the September SFSU event. However, Khaled never spoke at the SFSU event because Zoom, along with Facebook and YouTube, censored the symposium before it could even take place. So obviously here there's a sort of question of Zoom, Zoom censorship illegitimately conflating speech about terrorism however broadly or ideologically inaccurate terrorism is being defined here, as well as acts of terrorism, and then does so when terrorism isn't even the ostensive topic of discussion, right? So I just bring this up as an example of the importance of communications infrastructures in this case. And since we are now, and this panel is certainly a case in point, and dependent on things like Zoom, as well as Instagram, Facebook, or Apple, Intel, AT&T, Verizon, and so on. So political work and solidarity happens through significant activity and visibility on the web, on social media, on various communication platforms. Activists are subject to regimes of violence and surveillance, even if they live in liberal democracies. So as we consider to best engage, uh, as we consider how, sorry, to best engage in solidarity, um, we must attend to the question of where the places uh, of systemic power lie, where they're shared and where they're communicated. And so I think that we must also kind of consider or make legible technologies and infrastructures so that an infrastructure ontology can rework the very notion of the political and can call for very different forms of analytical work. 
we largely agree, I think certainly here amongst most of us and many in sort of progressive circles that we cannot an analytically understand social or political phenomenon in isolation, right? Hence intersectionality, for example. But just because we may speak of social inequalities or social problems or political orders or social justice or social change as social does not mean that they're only human or conversely, that we can bring in material realities and recognize that the substrate upon which we live are also social, even if it's something that we call the internet or Zoom or something. So let me just sort of um, move to a sort of much wider view uh, and kind of connect it to concerns um, on the ground in Palestine. So today we sit in the wake of transnational Palestinian solidarity politics that has developed since the 1930s and throughout the 60s and 70s, which has relied on solidarity between anti-racist and anti-colonial anti -colonial struggles across the globe. Algerian liberation movements, Black Panthers, the pictures that Shalene just showed, um, South African anti-apartheid activists, and so on. A lot of work has already focused on this identity and political intersectionality and the connection um, of the struggles of Palestinians with Black, Zapatistas, Native Americans, Indigenous peoples, and so on. So I'm not going to reiterate that. But I'll, I will note, however, that there's often this kind of emission of a fundamentally very different set of groups that also see uh, that, that also uh, kind of, if you want, work in solidarity with Palestinians, and that's the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, equally the governments of Turkey or Iran, or at the time, Hugo Chavez's Venezuela, right? So what you see is that within solidarity movements, the question of Palestine today is no longer framed solely as a project of territorial or national liberation. Instead, Palestine is conceived as one of the most visible, if continuously contentious, present day materializations of very broadly a global condition of coloniality. By deterritorializing and tethering the Palestinian struggle to wider collective struggles against settler colonialism, against racial, cap racial capitalism, or even more broadly against Western colonialism and other regimes, whether dictatorial or illiberal or otherwise, Palestine becomes this kind of analytic or this kind of ongoing laboratory. And so while intersectionality certainly has its benefits, part of the result, I think, back in Palestine is that this ends up kind of consuming, if you want, the political experiences of the colonized as opposed to engaging in a collective struggle against the systemic powers. Hence why among certain po Palestinian activists, there's this distancing from this thing called solidarity because solidarity is often seen as, you know, it's just simply NGOization or professionalization of political activism. And the effect is to sort of reproduce these hierarchies between international activists and Palestinians. And so in the struggle against a wide matrix of domination, Palestinians then are asked to navigate a contemporary context contradictorily characterized by enduring legacies of Western coloniality, the intersectional sensibilities characterizing the landscape of contemporary social movements and the interlocking nature of the hierarchies of power affecting movements both from within and from without. This is a formidable set of challenges when working on the ground in Palestine. Second, or, or sort of like the other thing to kind of consider, I'm almost done. The, the other thing to consider is that over the past decades, what it means to be Palestinian has also shifted. So that to consider the actual lived and heterogeneous experience of Palestinians, in the occupied territories and then within them, inside Israel, across the diaspora, is to recognize, to recognize that Palestinianness, if you want, is no longer or cannot be fixed for all. Palestinianness has shifted from an identity to a condition, from a network to a series of movements, right? So there's a sort of de-shifting de or destabilization, if you want, of identities. So my concern here is how might we then connect what seem like disparate concerns, experiences, or life worlds? Might a focus perhaps on the infrastructural, also in Palestine, be a way to more holistically address these issues, to find more common, even if sometimes virtual ground? So in Palestine, Palestinians live in a context that I've elsewhere called digital occupation. Internet controls, limited spectrum, surveillance of communication networks, economic and technological limits, definitely compounded by the Palestinian authorities and in some cases Hamas's own forms of control and censorship. I don't want to get into the details, but suffice it to say that when we consider these infrastructures and technologies, the parallels and overlaps are actually quite uh, 
shocking, right? Or kind of quite parallel in many ways. So that despite structural unevenness and flows, the importance and reliance on infrastructure is paramount. So activists are subject to regimes of violence and surveillance, not only in liberal, in liberal democracies, but everywhere. So can perhaps a wider infrastructural ontology, which reworks the very notion of the political, which calls for analytical rapprochement, force us to take into consideration both the systems that reproduce hierarchies between international activists, mobility privilege and Palestinian stuckness between the bodies that count, if you want, and those that are contained, surveyed and policed, and simultaneously also engage the systems in which collective struggle, or sorry, simultaneously, and also, <laughs> let me rephrase. Um, so can we consider those systems that reproduce these inequalities and also the systems in which we engage in the collective struggle against systemic power more holistically? Thank you. Way over time, sorry. Thank you very much to all the wonderful speakers for your very rich and thought provoking interventions. I have a question, Gayatri. Since we've we ran out of time, I have so many questions to ask, actually. But I know that we have fifteen minutes, and I did well, not. I would say um, I would say take. I, this is apologies to audience members who have asked questions, but I would say take take the remaining time that we have to engage in a moderated discussion, okay. and and I will we will send the questions that you ask to the panelists afterwards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, where do I start? This has been such a wonderful panel. Thank you all. Um, I have a few questions, actually. The first of which is uh, to, I think it would be fitting to ask for both Lisa and uh, Shaline. Um, Lisa, you talked a little bit about um, sort of uh, queer kinship as a network of relationality that sort of where alternative social institutions, uh, networks of care outside official forms of uh, financial structures and outside of state disciplines uh, um, can emerge. So for you, queer kinship is sort of uh, uh, that mode of relationality outside of official forms of financial relations and state discipline and so on and, 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 and um, uh, but, but I was wondering, and this also is, is a question that also um, might be fitting for Shalene, because Shalene, you also spoke about radical kinship and the importance of radical kinship in thinking solidarity or forms of negotiations between uh, ongoing sort of conflictual negotiations between what you called sort of the industrial uh, uh, migrants and uh, neoliberal migrants. And I was wondering, in both of your uh, discussions, what is the place of the state in these debates? Or how can we reconfigure uh, the, the, the place of the state, particularly if we're thinking about, uh, for example, uh, if we're talking about the sustainability of different forms of kinship, you both sort of were talking about somewhat, uh, uh, you, you were pushing for a different type of kinship that is sustainable or that we, you know, uh, we, 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 we would hope to be sustainable. What is the role of the state in this? How can we reconfigure the relationship? Is there a way of sort of uh, uh, um, thinking or organizing in relation to the state, particularly, you know, because questions such as, for example, housing, healthcare, social welfare arises in these instances. So how do you see your, uh, um, your understanding of radical kinship in relation to the state and how could these networks of kinship be sustainable outside of the premise or the framework of the state? Yeah. So that was a very long question phrasing it, but we can't hear you. Lisa, you need to unmute. Lisa, please unmute. Okay, I'm, I'm unmuted. Yeah, <laughs> okay, now I'm unmuted. I'll be brief because I'm actually most interested in what Chile has to say about this. But what I, I want to say briefly was I was trying to make, a, a, you know, a kind of tendentious distinction between being, being outside the structures of property or the state without necessarily being against them right without without mobilizing politically against them so I, I anyway but but the question in broad terms about the state is so huge at the moment you know I mean if you look for instance at what's going on in Latin America right and the very different engagements around what is the left and the splits between you know really very state-oriented party left politics and horizontalist uh, politics which can be quite anti-statist and 
Um, it's like every, every particular local context has a set of relations to different formations of the state so that there's no such thing as the state, right? There are the way one makes claims, right, on, on various organized institutions. And it varies so much that in a way, um, I think the only way to address it is to be very locally specific. Um, even while you're, we're dealing with global systems, but still the arraignment of for, you know, are we going to use the state to get national health care? Are we going to oppose the state, right, because of its policing and militarist stuff? And so the, the very um, complicated nature of like accessing and rejecting various functions of the state is so specific and different moments and in different um and in different places um so i think you know shalane your representation was so detailed and specific and about uh, that i think what you have to say might be more immediately illuminating about the context you're talking about you're muted yeah um you know i'm very specific to new york you know that's, that's where i'm standing um for us, the state, you know, like the state has always kind of like been our enemy, <laughs> you know, like the, they have been organizing against us in every way and continue to do so. Like for the last couple of years, uh, you know, that I was a member of Take Back the Bronx, we were, we were, you know, galvanizing against a rezoning, you know, and we're not the only ones. I know in Brooklyn, there was like a lot of galvanization or against rezonings. So like the state is actually always working against us and you know like i'm of the opinion that you know like the ngos the nonprofits in this are just an extension of the state you know what i'm saying um so for us the the only you know like we're like it's always guerrilla warfare tactics you know we're working from the bottom up we don't give a shit about the state really you know because the where our where I, I think where our our power and our energies need to go is in um, fortifying relations on the ground amongst the people to be able to um, withstand whatever the state is going to try to throw at us because they will just continue to bob and weave and reconfigure themselves uh, you know against every move we make you know um, so. The state really is just like for us right now, like especially in a place like New York, where where the state is like is a split personality. They're like pretending to be a city, like we're in New York City. We care, like you know, right now we're in the middle of like mayoral elections. It's a facade. They don't really give a shit. They're only here to manage Wall, you know, um, finance for Wall Street to be to con for, so that New York continues to be the global center of you know the empire. You know what I'm saying? So like. We don't. We, we our focus isn't really there, you know. Thank you very much, Celine. Um, maybe that also brings me to a different question, which probably links both Celine's and uh, Helga's interventions around the emphasis on um, infrastructures and uh, infrastructures of livability, and particularly Celine, you spoke a little bit about how you so. Uh, um, community uprooting through process of gentrification as a form of settler colonialism, right? And uh, uh, Helga, you uh, sort of called for recognizing uh, infrastructural concerns as part of doing solidarity work. And I was wondering whether you both could see resonances somehow in terms of both your presentations or um, and, and I, mean, I, I would like to probe you a little bit, Shalene, about how you see gentrification as, you know, through the framework of settler colonialism. That's the first question. And maybe then talk together about how the underlying concern that you're both addressing has also to do with processes of gentrification, infrastructures of livability, or the lack thereof because of gentrification as such. Yeah. Should I answer this now? Maybe Helga, you want to take a shot. I feel like I'm talking a lot. All right. Um, Go ahead. All right. Well, shooting from the hip then. Um, you know, what? what is gentrification? I feel like it's such a loaded word. I don't even like to use it anymore. Like, you know, I, I just say displacement or dispossession now. You know, when you say displacement and dispossession, you know, 
then you then you see it everywhere mm-hmm. you know um, I think that also gentrification is like just one feature in a whole overarching process and that's where that's where I think it links to settler colonial violence you know my good friend Amin Hussein who's Palestinian always reminds me every time I start to cry you know or whine about you know like watching what has happened in places like Brooklyn you know come to the Bronx that you know we're 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 <laughs> this notion of home and and the fact that uh, you know might be something that we need to re- reconsider because uh, dispossession seems to be the name of the game the same mm-hmm. way that real the, the more the more that they that they uh, you know are are wielding real estate as a power in a mm-hmm. land grab dispossession mm-hmm. seems to be like the common denominator for everybody and so we need to prepare ourselves and when a Palestinian says that shit to you you take it seriously so uh, I guess you know to answer your question it's you know dispossession as the common denominator there it is you know mm-hmm. which yeah which which make reminds me a little bit of um a recent talk I heard by Robin Kelly speaking about how thinking about solidarity in terms of analogies or comparison is inevitably sort of, it's impossible, right? That analogies are not the ways in which we build solidarities, but actually thinking about how struggles are entangled, right? And once we think that struggles are entangled and the fight is against forms of dis- dispossession, racialized states, violence, that cause harm, death, and debilitation to our bodies, communities, and infrastructures, that's when we sort of see that our struggles are interconnected and solidarity could um, yeah, um, be nurtured and solidified in that sense. So yeah, Helga, did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I think, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I was very clear, but I, part of what, I was, what I'm thinking about and sort of questioning is, is perhaps on sort of two different realms, right? One is on a sort of more theoretical, what can certain kinds of scholarship give us as tools? And the other is a sort of obviously sort of much more practical, right? So Mm -hmm. it, it is this kind of, how do we form radical solidarities when increasingly uh, different causes are supported by such an array of different groups and are calling for such different things, right? So mm-hmm. to me, that's sort of like a question that I continuously grapple with. That's sort of one. And then the other is, you know, in a world in which, um, I, I know this is like very 1980s, but it's, I can't think of another term right now, but it's sort of like in which identity politics kind of still plays a very prominent role. I, I feel like, okay, but is there not a way to sort of reconnect or, or re-engage these different platforms, right? And so I, I just sort of wonder if something like infrastructure studies, which looks at you know the relationships between people and things or the more than human, if you want, whether it's animals or nature or environment or the Anthropocene or whatever it is, right? There's something, I, I, I'm wondering if there's something within that theoretical sort of set of concerns that can help us move beyond, that can help us redefine what radical might mean beyond or inclusive inclusive of identity, but also more than identity, right? So what are the structures that we share, right? So dispossession, housing, uh, you know, whether you want to call it gentrification or settler colonialism. So part part of my concern is kind of on that theoretical level, while also part of my concern is very much about is there a way to reformulate connections among these radically different groups? And I don't mean radical, but radically different, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Around a different set of concerns. And and I just sort of wonder whether something like what we use every day uh, Mm -hmm. in order to do our work is perhaps one way to sort of uh, reimagine what we mean by kinship, right? So the kinship of, I don't know, I mean, it's going to sound crazy, but Zoom users, right? Or, or in that kind of way, that's sort of what I meant it. So, you know, we're, we're out of time, but I want to just take two, I want to go over time for just two minutes, Layal, if I may. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I actually wanted to pose a question both to Che and to Shailin, because Che very importantly pointed us to the space of the aesthetic as a place of thinking through questions of solidarity. And Shailin, you know, you you know, you're, you're talking about the way in which um, artists and the whole entire art infrastructure and ecosystem is also embedded within these structures of 
a violence in some ways. And so I guess my question to both of you is, how, you know, how do you see the aesthetic sort of working in relation to this question of solidarity? But also, you know, what, how do artists of color sort of navigate these systems? So. Yeah, I, you. I'll let you answer that question. Okay, I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, thank you so much for, for the question, Gatri. Uh, just to kind of piggyback on Helga's interventions, uh, I, I think for me, um, thinking struggles and, and solidarity through blackness, um, not as a political identity, but rather as a critique of identity itself um, has been really powerful to bypass, you know, kind of what Frank Wilderson calls the ruse of analogy, that comparative approach that collapses distinctions. And I loved, Lisa, what you said about um, almost like being tactical uh, about the, about the, the state and kind of zeroing, zooming in and figuring out what's going on in these localized spaces as a way to not um, disappear difference and to treat textures like with um, some kind of like political integrity. And I think that also applies to um, solidarity ac uh, across time and space. And so for me, when thinking about Palestine, you know, I think around part of a ruse of analogy would be like comparing the Palestinian, um, the occupation and the terms of it to like, um, uh, forms of apartheid within a racial liberal telos as though those weren't active and ongoing. So I, I think for me, it's been important to think about like what's uh, Afro-Palestinian struggle and how that from within Palestinian, the, the kind of coordinates of, of Palestine helps us to think about even press at the question of sovereignty itself and think about you know, how is it that anti-blackness works in these spaces, not only to, not to like say we shouldn't be in solidarity, but to say we need an analysis of that to be in uh, a, a strong, a, a kind of um, substantive, not, not strong sense of solidarity. Uh, and so thinking about how for black Palestinians, the struggle is also against anti-blackness as well. Um, and so I think that for me opens up a lot of generative questions about kinship that shape our activism. Um, and to go back to Gatry, your question about aesthetics, uh, I think it's, it, it's um, uh, hmm. I guess I, I feel like it's complicated and Shelly Ann, I really appreciated your, um, your kind of landscaping of the, NGOs and, and the kind of way that the art world is caught up with these systems of domination and, you know, decolonize this place. And, and this past summer, I think it was like a lot of the attention to the who's on the boards of these museums and, and things like this, um, the kind of strings. Um, and yeah, so I don't have a, a kind of um, purist so solution to that, to go back to Lisa's recommendation about like local struggle. Um, I, I do think there's powerful work, like for instance, the work of Nicole Fleetwood around car this idea of carceral aesthetics and her exhibition that just recently wrapped up uh, at MoMA PS1, which was about art in an era of mass incarceration that corresponded with her book as an example of artists critiquing policing. Um, and so part of what my work is doing is look looking at relationships between abolition and aesthetics and how abolition might also be an aesthetic practice that isn't about like the art object, but is about a kind of, um, you know, Foucauldian, well, not Foucauldian, but to use this language, um, well, maybe it is, but to use this language, aesthetics of existence. So thinking about, you know, what are the forms of sociality and life, but also what are the art, like American artists, for example, their work on predictive policing. What, what's, how is art also um, being a site of struggle um, even as it's kind of also um, interfacing with the, with the museum itself? So, which could be the same question of the academic and the university, for example, um, that kind of double bind. So yeah, those are just like disparate thoughts. So thanks. Thank you, Che. Shalene, do you wanna say a few words? Yeah, I'll take a, I'll take a stab at it. 
Um, I'm a little all over the place in in my thinking about it, but um, you know, like during during my my little presentation, uh, I pointed to uh, the battle that we have internally as uh, deindustrial migrants with you know our neighbors who are doing who are selling real estate in their own gentrified neighborhoods or the rank and file like you know uh, labor workers who are like constructing luxury. I see I see myself along those lines. I, I don't think the artist is outside of that contradiction and that paradox. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as artists of color, I like, I, I just, this is, we're, we're working within a structure that is literally eating us alive. So I'm not, I'm not going to make any, uh, I'm not going to make any leeway passages for artists of color by virtue of artists being of color, especially when we're watching museums literally use black, indigenous, so-called Latinx and queer artists as human shields. Mm -hmm. Two years before the last biennial with, uh, where Candace was uh, removed was the Dana Schutz situation. The response from the Whitney was to make a black biennial. You see what I'm saying? Human shields. Therefore, it complicates the conversation. You know, like this is Fanon 101. We watched Brooklyn Museum like pad their uh, their programming with like one after the other. The rat, the radical Latinx. You know, the Stonewall show. The the show that Rujeko put up. The the Black Power show. Candace gets uh, taken off the board literally. <laughs> At the same time that Wangechimutu statues are like sitting in the arches, like front light fucking soldiers, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And Kahinde's got a Confederacy uh, statue in, in Times Square. So, you know, we will all like, listen, you know, there, there's always a way to instrumentalize and weaponize us against ourselves using our differences. We need to be very mindful of that. So then, you know, the common denominator amongst us is that we need to be, uh, you know, are we work, are we striving, do, are we anti-imperialists? Are we anti-capitalists? And so then um, as artists, I think that we, sh we shouldn't put ourselves in a bubble. You know what I'm saying? We should be thinking like the labor worker. We, we should be thinking like Punjabi farmers. We need to dump our fucking load in the middle of the West Side Highway. And so then how do, artists who you know like you know my teenagers when I when I back when I had a job you know thought that you know like thought that being an artist man you know how to draw and then they, you know the next question is can you draw me my name in bubble letters um but you know sure sure um I think that really what what it is to be an artist is like the ability to see profoundly you can see shit you can see something and you're trying to like articulate that through whatever medium of your choice. How do we use our power to see as artists, to see the structures and then like undermine them? You know, these, this is like, you know, a metaphysical question perhaps, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I don't make those distinctions, you know? Thank you so much, Helene. Um, Lyle, do you want to wrap it up for us? We're way over time, but it was such a great conversation. I I, mean, I wanted to say thank you so much for such wonderful interventions and discussions and I hope we can continue the conversations in other ways shapes or forms and some time in the future so thank you very much for such a rich event and thank you Gayatri and Robert and Josh Absolutely. thanks for having us thank you bye-bye